Hi, I'm Dr. Jackson Crawford. I'm a specialist in the Old Norse language and a historical linguist, currently teaching at the University of California, Berkeley, and as of fall 2017, happy returning home to the Rockies to teach at the University of Colorado Boulder. Over the school year that's now concluding, I have, for some reason, been posting videos about topics in Norse language and myth, and also sometimes about more general linguistics questions, and today what I want to address is something more in the general linguistics vein. The regularity of sound change is one of the most important discoveries of the field of historical linguistics in the past two centuries or so that it's existed. Basically, if a given sound changes in one place in a language, in one word or root, that sound will change in the same way in other words and roots in the language, barring some other sound change that prevents the operation of this sound change. So, for example, in the last century or so, the English language has been losing a sound. The sound wh, which is spelled wh, or was spelled wh, in words where it's present. Outside of a very few pockets, such as parts of Scotland and parts of the United States, this sound has become a w, a wh, everywhere that it once existed. I'm kind of a fossil because I picked it up from older relatives. The WH that you see spelled in words like which or why or where is routinely, regularly replaced by W, so you get which, why, where. You are not going to expect that if a speaker does have that hua sound like me, if I say which, why, where, you would be surprised to find out that a word like W-H-A-L-E Whale, you would be pretty surprised if I said like Dale, right? This violates the regularity of sound change. I routinely have that hua, or you routinely have that W. There's not going to be some surprise case where one of us has a D or a P or something there instead. Similarly, I know that I'm going to say when, and I'm expecting that you're going to say when or when. I don't expect that you're going to say, you know, Ben. So, this regularity is sort of a no-brainer, but it's actually surprising just how consistent it is and how consistent it is looking backwards at earlier stages of the language. So we know from the efforts of historical linguists since about the 1780s that most languages of Europe and the western or southwestern part of Asia are all related and share a common ancestor, and we call these the Indo-European languages because they stretch from India to Europe. I have a separate video, which I'll link in a card in the top right, that discusses the uh, sub-branches of the Indo-European language family and gives some examples of languages in each branch. But suffice to say that the regular relationship of these languages can be demonstrated by regular sound changes, just like the hua to wa rule that's occurring in English right now. One of the most famous documentations of a regular sound change in all of historical linguistics actually concerns the way that consonants from Proto-Indo-European, the ancestor language of all the Indo-European languages, develop into the Germanic languages. Now, the Germanic languages are not languages descended from German, although they include German. The Germanic languages include English, German, Dutch, Frisian, Yiddish, the Scandinavian languages, Swedish, Norwegian, Faroese, Icelandic, Danish, and also the extinct language Gothic and its close relatives. I have a video that discusses the timeline of Old Norse, one of the Germanic languages, and includes some discussions about the other Germanic languages too. I'll post that in a link in a card in the top right as well. But basically, along the way to becoming the Germanic languages, the Indo-European language in Northern Europe had certain consonant changes occur, and these consonant changes are called Grimm's Law. And today, you can look at a Germanic language like English and look at the consonants, especially at the beginning of words where there have been fewer sound changes in the ensuing centuries to affect things, and see a regular relationship between those consonants and the consonants in other Indo-European languages. So what I've got set up here are the changes of Grimm's Law with the Proto-Indo-European sound on the left side with an asterisk representing reconstruction. It's typical in linguistics, we write an asterisk next to a sound or word if it's not actually tested in writing anywhere. And then to the right side, I have what comes out in the Germanic languages, including English. 
So for my examples, since I only have so much space on this little board, I just have one of each sound, but uh, as they occur to me, I'll also provide some others. And I've mostly used Latin to represent the other Indo-European languages. This is just because Latin is the most familiar old Indo-European language to most speaker Indo-European language to most speakers of English. But down here, I've had to rely on Sanskrit and Greek a little bit more. Don't interpret this as meaning that Latin is the ancestor of English because it isn't. It's just that Latin is a distant cousin that keeps the sounds of Proto-Indo-European more routinely than the Germanic languages do. So the first cluster of changes under Grimm's law are P to F, T to Th, which in old Germanic languages like Old Norse and Old English is typically written with the letter thorn, which looks a little bit like a P with an extra bar at the top, and K to H. In linguistics terms, voiceless stops become homorganic voiceless fricatives. So P to F, we see, for instance, Latin pater keeps the P, but English father has the P turn into an F. Another good example of this would be Latin piscus fish, where English has fish, F. We also see, for instance, in Latin tenuis, thin, and English thin. The T has become a th. Or Latin cort, the root word for heart, and English heart. Another series of changes includes B to P, D to T, and G to K. In linguistics terms, voice stops become homorganic voiceless stops. This one is hard to find examples of because there's actually extremely little B in Proto-Indo-European for whatever reason. That means that P is pretty rare in early Germanic languages. So a weak example that I have dug up is Latin baculum, which is cognate with English peg, but I think even English peg is a loan from another Germanic language from older Dutch. There's also D to T, which there are more examples of. Latin dent, or Greek daunt for tooth, cognate with English teeth. This also gives you a nice example of T to TH. The loss of N before a fricative here in English is quite regular. G to K, there's the Latin root gel that you'll find in English words like gelid or glacier. This is a root for cold, and then English words like cool and cold. Proto-European also had a series of voiced aspirates, so ba, da, ga. I'm probably saying those poorly to someone with a fine accent for these things, someone who perhaps speaks an Indic language that still has these sounds. Since Latin also loses these, it's hard to use Latin as an example here, but I can use Sanskrit, which keeps them as an example. So for instance, Sanskrit brother is cognate with English brother, where we have the BH turning into just a B. Also notice another good example of T to TH. Duh. And for instance, Sanskrit madhu is English mead. This is honey or a sweet drink. So English mead, of course, a drink made from honey. And the GH disappears in Sanskrit too, but it becomes a KH written chi in Greek. So I'll use a Greek example here, cane which becomes, or which is cognate with English goose. This is another case where a nasal, like here, has been lost before a fricative in English and its closest relatives. If you look at any given native word of English, that is a word that's not borrowed from another language, you will find that there is almost always some cognate in multiple other Indo-European languages outside the Germanic group that has the, that shows the effect in English of Grimm's Law. So for instance, something as simple as English hound for a dog is cognate with Latin con, like in canine, or something like English uh, for or from, that prepositional uh, fr is cognate with Latin pro, which we see in many borrowed words in English. One of the interesting things about English is that it's borrowed so many words from Latin and from Latin-derived languages like French that you often have words that are affected by Grimm's Law, the native English vocabulary, and words that are not affected by Grimm's Law because they've been borrowed from Latin, which has no Grimm's Law because it's not Germanic.
So you have to watch out in English and sort of sift through the borrowed versus the unborrowed vocabulary. For instance, we have father, but we also have paternal from Latin. We have thin, but we also have a tenuous argument from Latin. We have heart, but we also have cordial greetings, etc. So that's something you have to watch for. But for the native vocabulary, sound changes like Grimm's Law allow us to formulate in very exact terms exactly how languages have changed over time. And by back projecting those laws and sort of undoing them, they allow us to reconstruct earlier stages of a language. From the University of California, I'm wishing you all the best.